Chapter 3, Maintaining Windows. The primary objective of this chapter is how to work with preventive maintenance, schedule tasks, things that will keep the PC running healthy. We're going to talk about disaster recovery, we're going to talk about backups, user data, as well as Windows system files. We're going to learn about some of the commands to manage files and folders and how to use the disk management to work on the hard drive. We're also going to learn about language settings. One of the first things we have to talk about is scheduled preventive maintenance. Essentially, we want to keep the PC running fast and healthy. So how we do that is we verify critical window settings, we clean up the hard drive, we check the drive for errors, and we clean up free space. Those are among the most common tasks. We're going to cover each one of them. Verifying critical window settings. There are three primary window settings that most users need to know about. That are updating windows, antivirus, and network location settings. These three areas are critical. Windows updates because as Windows gets holes, the updates fix them. Antivirus software to keep and uh, to keep viruses away. Antivirus is a very loose term. You could also include anti-malware software in here as, uh, as well. And that is not just having it installed, but running the scans regularly, both in antivirus and anti-malware. Lastly, checking that Windows 7, uh, the network location is set correctly. For example, if you have a laptop and you're at Starbucks, when you connect wirelessly, are you choosing the public wireless profile, or are you choosing the home public pro uh, the home profile? Those are things that we have to look at. Uh, next, cleaning up the hard drive, deleting unneeded files occasionally, which kind of frees up some of the free space. But it's important to realize what is unneeded versus what is needed. Most novel users think nothing is needed. There are certain folders that are required for Windows to run. The Windows folder, for example. Anything that's in there, normally I tell people, stay out. However, if you want to go into the temp folder, or the uh, internet cache folder, or even the recycle bin, those are all areas that hold data that can be removed. Other ways that we can clean up the hard drive is by def uh, defragging it, checking for errors, if uh, performance is not an issue, we can compress a folder or zip a folder. We could also move files and folders to other drives or other locations so that they're off that hard drive. Defragging the hard drive is essentially just making all the small pieces that make up a file or folder move them closer together. Uh, checking the drive for errors. With anything mechanical, errors happen. It's just a fact of life. So we check the uh, hard drive for errors just so that we can know its health, its status. If we know a hard drive is failing or parts are having issues, that knowledge allows us to correct that. Compressing the folders, again, it allows us to shrink folders. Sometimes not very much, sometimes a great deal. It really all depends. Lastly, moving files and folders to other drives. Sometimes, if we have large data that we don't access regularly, we can move them to a, a slower hard drive, or we can move them to like a thumb drive or something else. Now we have to talk about the directory structure. Very specifically, when a user profile is logged in, at, when a user is logged in, it logs into their profile namespace, which is normally their, whatever their username is called. You normally can find this under the primary hard drive, typically C drive, slash users. Underneath there, it has all the users that have ever signed in. Because what Windows does is, the first thing it does when a user signs in, is create them a folder. If they already have a folder, it logs into that folder. That's called its namespace. NTU user, NTUser.dat, 
is a file that stores configuration for your user profile. Every time you make a change, it updates the ntuser.bat file. One of the next key areas is the program fo uh, files folder. This comes in two flavors typically. If you have a 64-bit operating system, you have the program files folder and you also have the program files x86 folder. Basically they try to keep the 64-bit programs in one folder and the 32-bit files in another program or another folder. We also have the folders for window data, which is the Windows folder essentially. It things have key, it keeps things like the registry location, which is underneath system 32. It keeps backup of the registry, which is also under system 32. It does fonts, temporary files. Even here with the Windows files that are stored underneath temp. Most novel users, I tell, stay out of the Windows folder. You can find other ways to clean up that temp folder that won't uh, cause any issues. We also have offline files, which are basically mapped drives that we can save offline. So that the next time we access that map drive, it will just update them. That way, our data, our files, are with us no matter where we go typically really used for laptop users that are connecting to and off the network continuously, offline files are great for that. It essentially allows them to work with their files anywhere and then every time they connect back to the network it just updates the network uh, files. Now let's talk about how we use disk cleanup uh, tools. Normally uh, the one that's built into Windows is called disk cleanup this cleanup actually does allow us to access the Windows temp folder, but nothing else. And this way is a lot better for most users. Because if you tell them to start digging in the Windows folder, they can do some damage. Using this cleanup, it will only access the Windows temp folder, as well as other location that is safe to delete files from. Normally it also allows us to uh, do offline web pages, or a cycle bin, service pack uh, backup files, other temporary files as well. Most people do not realize that when we delete something, it really just goes to the recycle bin. We have to empty the recycle bin from time to time to actually get some of that free space back. Now, if you're afraid of deleting something that you might need long, uh, later, when you actually delete them from the recycle bin, it doesn't always delete everything. There are always still remnants or small portions of that file that are still there. Most of the time, they can be recovered. Normally needing specialized tools to do that, but it can happen. If you are afraid of deleting or removing a file you might need, if you click on the more option, I normally tell people to turn on shadow copies. Basically what a shadow copy is, is when you open up a file, it creates a backup of it. And so that you can actually, as you progress through a file, as you update it, let's say you're writing a term paper. As you add more to it and save more, it updates those shadow copies. So at any point, you want to go back to a different version, you have that ability. Another tool that we have is defrag, uh, or Windows defrag. It allows us to defrag the hard drive, which I've already brought up was essentially just moving in the files that are common closer together. How that works is basically it looks at every chunk of the hard drive and it looks at all the data. Like data, gets put together for quicker access. There are two types of hard drives, uh, normal magnetic hard drive or HDD. Uh, there's also a newer style hard drive called a SSD or solid state drive. Normally we do not defrag a solid state drive. 
Windows actually should not let you defrag it at all. Uh, the reasoning behind that is SSDs, like a thumb drive, they can only be written to so many times. And so by defragging them, you actually can lose some of that performance of that drive. It also has no moving parts, so by defragging it, doesn't uh, actually speed it up at all. Versus a regular or traditional HDD that actually does have moving parts, the further the read-write head has to move to read more data, the slower it becomes. So, defragging it puts all the light data together, essentially making it run faster. How the defrag looks, it looks for clusters of those files, or like files. Every time we write data to and from a hard drive, it starts fragmenting the hard drive. Turning on Windows creates tons of temporary files and folders. And as we work through other programs or with documents or just basic use, it cre uh, creates, Windows creates lots of just files that are temporary. And so the process of creating, then deleting, then creating, then deleting fragments our hard drive. So that's one of the issues with our typical hard drive. That's why we have to defrag it. This does affect performance if you have a traditional hard drive. And it can actually make your PC run quite slow. Here's an example of the disk defragger. Normally you analyze the disk, which basically just gives you a percentage of if it's defragmented uh, or not. And then the actual defragment disk will defrag it. Next, checking the hard drive for errors. Like I said before, any moving parts, anything mechanical, we get errors. That's just commonplace. It's important to note here, though, you cannot scan or check for errors on something that you're using. For example, C drive. If Windows is running, you're accessing C drive. So it makes it a little harder to run check disk on, or checking the drive for errors, normally using check disk, uh, on C drive. What Windows tools will do is actually make you uh, restart. The tool is called Check Disk, and it normally does two things. It automatically fixes file system errors, and it could also scan for errors and attempt to recover bad sectors. The bad sector is just bad portions of your hard drive that happen with time. Here's an example. If uh, you have to scan C drive, when you click start, it'll give you a warning message saying you can't do it on C drive, but you want to schedule it the next time Windows starts. That works just as good. Freeing up space on the hard drive. You can also do this with, uh, by uninstalling software you no longer use, moving the data, moving the programs, or compressing. What is really interesting here is most people will actually keep software on their computer that they don't use. Uh, normally games or older programs or programs that they haven't really used in a long time, what Windows does, it will actually analyze when is the last time you accessed a specific program. And so when you go to uninstall something, you can actually see when is the last time you accessed it. Some games take up huge amounts of space as well. So these are all ways that you can free up space. Uh, you could also delete files or move files. One file in particular is the page file.sys. Uh, it's also typically referred to as the virtual, memi the virtual memory paging file. Basically, if you have a limited amount of RAM, memory will actually 
save some of that information in a painting file on your hard drive, and it can grow quite large. You can also change the size or move it to a different hard drive. Normally it's so, uh, stored on C drive by default, but you can change it. If we look at the system's property, and we go down to performance, click on settings, we actually have the ability to look at the performance options. First tab is the visual effects. Do you like it looking pretty, essentially? The second tab is the advanced tab. Basically, do we want the processor to focus more on programs or background services? But notice the second box, virtual memory. This is where we can actually set the size if we want to manage uh, the system to manage it or if we don't want it at all. The rule of thumb typically is a static size. So notice that if we do a custom size, we can do the initial or the start size and then the maximum size. I normally tell people you want one solid chunk of storage. You don't want it being able to be varied. So you take how much RAM you have or how much memory you have times that by 1.5 and that's the recommended setting. That might be kind of old. Uh, I've used that since 98 uh, Windows 2000 but on most of the Microsoft most of the Microsoft exam that I've taken they always say use that same rule of thumb so I've kept using it. However if you have 16 18, 20 gigs of memory, newer, newer, newer and newer computers are getting more and more memory. You don't need that, quite that much. If your page file is greater than 6 or 7 gigabytes, you're good. You don't really need to have it larger than that. Uh, once you do a custom size, or if you change the option, you have to click Set that will actually save it. If you're unsure, let the system manage it for you. That's the nice thing about Windows, is sometimes it's smarter than us in regards to it running itself. So if you don't want to do a customized setting, let Windows manage it itself. It will change in size, but for some users, if you don't feel comfortable, that's the greatest option. Next, let's talk about backups. The backup procedure is normally done so we don't lose data. Uh, whether that be a copy of the data uh, or a snapshot of the data right this second, backups are extremely important because hard drives fail, systems fail, viruses, file corruptions, accidents, things happen. Data is extremely important. Most people do not realize that if data is not backed up regularly and tested to make sure it's properly backed up, if there is ever an issue, more than likely you lost the vast majority of data. And within the business setting, most businesses, well over 80%, if a business has a data loss, typically they're out of business in the first year. That's how important data backups are. Also, you never want to trust a backup of just one media. Uh, for example, I have photos of my great-grandmother before she passed away. I have it backed up in six different locations just to make sure I have a backup copy of it. It's important. Once I lose that file, I can never get it back. In business, they don't have the luxury of rebuilding data that was lost. Time is money within businesses, and if they have to rebuild data, again, it costs money, and it costs lots of money. 
and we're assuming that they even have the ability to rebuild it. Let's talk about planning for a disaster recovery. Normally, first thing we want to do is decide on the backup media. Do we want tapes? Do we want a DVD or Blu-ray? Do we want a USB hard drive? How do we want to do it? Uh, next, what software do we want to do it? Uh, do we want the built-in Windows tools? Do we want a third party? Do we want a backup solution that saves it to the cloud? How do we want it? After we decide what software and media, we decide what strategy we want. If you're if you're a home user, do you want do you have to back up every few hours, or is once a day okay, or is once a week okay, or is once a month okay? If you're a large business, is once a day okay, or does it have to be several times a day? Those are all considerations that have to be made. I normally take care of an accountant firm. During January to May, they back up once every hour. Uh, June through December, we back up once a day. But, they also bill $500 per hour, so if one hour goes by and they lose any data, they don't want to be out hundreds of dollars. And that quickly adds up. After we do that, we have to talk about how are we going to test the recovery process. So we have a backup, but if we don't ever check it or test it, how can we make sure that it is proper, that it really backed up the data, that our data is really safe and secure? We can't. And this is a key area because most companies, if they back up, and that's a huge if, fewer and fewer of them actually test their backups. We have had issues where we tried recovering from a DVD backup and the disk was damaged. We had no backup. Even though we had the media for the backup, we ran the backup, but we never bothered to test the backups. And so our backup never really worked. Next, keep backups in a safe place and test them. Obviously the testing goes back to the recovery process and verifying. Uh, but where should we uh, save these backups to? One of the issues with backups is let's say you back up financials. Well those financials are extremely important. You don't want that backup just in any old place. Normally we keep them under lock and key uh, or if you're afraid of a fire we do an off-site or second location backup, also under lock and key. Uh, a big part of this is so that no matter what happens, you have access to your backups. And you also make sure that the data that you're backing up is still protected and secured. It's important to go over this because numerous times, especially within a certain education institutions, I have came across where they would back up student data, for example, and it would go to a DVD. The DVD would just be stacked in some guy's office. Not, lock, not under lock and key, not under supervision, and each one of those disks contained hundreds of student records that were supposed to be protected, and they really weren't. So that's one of those issues. You want to make sure that your backups are secure, so that the data that you're backing up is also secure. Uh, we already talked about we cannot back up or we cannot access files that are currently in use. So how do you back up Windows or the Windows volume? You can do this through a process called a system image. Basically that is a snapshot of Windows at that particular moment. Any data that's changed five minutes after the snapshot the backups aren't going to have that. It's only going to be from that specific time. I normally tell people do not rely on the system image as your backup. Keep regular backups of your data and use the system image for Windows backup. 
If we go to Control Panel, Navigate to System and Security, or to just Backups and Restore, we get this lovely screen. From here, we have the ability to backup or restore, create a system image, or also create repair disks. Repair disks are essentially a system image, but recording two disks, versus a system image is sometimes just a snapshot that is saved on the hard drive itself. Uh, the system image is good, don't get me wrong, but sometimes if you want to make sure that you have the disks to restore, I tell people to create a system repair disk, which is essentially a system image just using physical either CDs or DVDs. If we do a backup process, we can actually select our backup. So essentially if we're creating and using backups on Windows, uh, we normally choose the backup option or the restore window. Uh, we select where we want to actually store it. Backups are very finicky. It will not let you back up to the same hard drive. Windows just doesn't let you. You have the ability to then select what you want to back up. You have the option of letting Windows choose or you can also choose yourself. If you choose yourself, you would just click on the boxes that you want to back up. Normal places of data are the user's data folder, because it holds all the user data, um, or any of the other folders that you might have created yourself. Uh, you can also select the library and folders you want to back up. Once you do that, you click Next, and it will actually ask you if you are sure you want to back up these files, and then you can say yes and run the backup itself. Uh, here is the example of save backups on. You'll notice there is no C drive. We're assuming we're backing up C drive, and thus it is not there. Here we have the ability to focus on the data files or the folders themselves. Normally I tell people to also do data files and the users area, just in case. It's better to back up too much than not enough. After we create a backup, we can actually recover it the same way. Instead of choosing the backup option, we choose the recovery option. Earlier we brought up volume shadow copying. Here is an example of the volume shadow copying or the previous versions area. If we opened up an Excel file and we made several changes, if we right click on it and go to properties, we get these tabs. If we're looking at the previous versions, every time we saved it, it saved a new version. So we can always go back to a previous version. Going back to the Windows System Protection or the system images, we have things called restore points. Sometimes they are set automatically, not all the time though. Uh, you can actually go to the recovery tools for Windows to verify but essentially a restore point is a snapshot of Windows components. Not your data, but just Windows components. What that allows you to do is if Windows gets corrupted, you have the ability to go back to it or to go back in time to fix it. Uh, but it is not backup data. Normally, it's predisposed to use 15% of your total disk space, but you have the ability to change it. If we're looking at the system properties of Windows, under System Protection, we have our System Restore options. 
normally it's off on all other hard drives other than the RC drive, but we can change that. We can turn them on depending on our needs. You can also configure and create those restore points from this location. Now do you apply a restore point? If you put in, uh, if Windows starts, you can actually go to the systems recovery portion and you can actually click on restore previous point. If Windows does not start, you can actually put in a Windows disk and go through its advanced uh, troubleshooting repair and it will actually give you a point, uh, an option to restore or recover from a restoration point. So if you can't go into Windows, it's okay. You have a Windows disk handy, you can load those backups from a Windows disk. Points to remember for the system restore is it recovers from errors only. It does not remove viruses. It does not backup data. It can also create new problems. There can be issues here. It also can sometimes not work. So, a restore point is not as good as backups or a system image or repair disks. Next, we're going to talk about managing files, folders, and the devices. So, let's talk about the hard drive itself. The hard drive itself is broken up into two different categories partitions and file system. The partition is essentially how we're going to chunk our hard drive. We can have a physical hard drive that is chunked different ways. Um, that would be different partitions. For example, if you pre-buy a Dell or HP computer, they come with two partitions. A recovery partition and then just a regular partition for everything else. Sometimes they might chunk it three ways. Recovery, Windows, and Data. It really all depends on how the user wants to organize their hard drive. Even if they want to organize their hard drive this way. Again, this takes a physical drive and chunks it. A magnetic hard drive is broken up into actual metal platters. This is more hardware, but it's still kind of important to know. Every chunk of a hard drive is broken into sectors or tracks, sectors and tracks. A track is just a track of the ring, and a sector is just a slice of a track. So our partitions are kept in a partition table, and the first part of that partition table is known as the master boot record, or MBR. Basically, the MBR is a catalog or an index for, all, for where all the data is stored on the hard drive. So let's say, for example, you delete a folder on your hard drive. You actually don't delete the data. All you really do is remove the index to where that file or folder is located. If the MBR doesn't know about it, there's nothing there. So the MBR can overwrite whatever in that chunk or that segment of data. For a typical MBR, we have three types of partitions. Partitions sometimes are also called volumes, but a partition and a volume, while they're very similar, they're not the same. Partitions normally deal with a basic hard drive. If we're dealing with a dynamic or advanced hard drive, they're called volumes. We have a supplemental lecture on partition styles that will cover partitions and volumes. So don't worry about that. We have primary partition and an a extended partition. Essentially, just the primary partitions is how many ways can we chunk it? Those can be our primary partitions. 
But you notice we can only have up to three. If we want a fourth chunk, we have to use what's called an extended partition. Here is examples of our partitions. Using one physical hard drive, we can chunk it into five other hard drives. A C, a D, an E, an F, and a G hard drive. For whatever reason, why we might want to do this? Notice it also lists the file systems. We haven't talked about this, but we're going to talk about it in a few slides, so if you're not familiar with the terms NTFS or FAT, don't worry about it just yet. We're going to come back to this. Now, before you can actually access a partition, we have to assign it a drive letter. Essentially, if we partition it, it could just be unknown, and we don't have a way to access it until we give it a known letter. The letters are one-time use letters, so there can only be one C drive, only one D drive, local to that machine. So that's kind of important. After you assign it a letter, you have to format it. Normally you format it in one of three file systems, NTFS, FAT32, or XFAT. Those are just the ones that Windows 7 support. Realistically, it's normally NTFS, for everything. That's the Windows secured file system. Don't worry, we haven't talked about it yet, but we will get there. Now we have partitions. We have two types of partitions in particular we have to talk about. The system partition and the boot partition. The system partition is normally your C drive, but you have a boot partition. Basically, the boot partition tells the system partition where Windows is actually loaded. So when you hit the power button on your computer, it goes through that initial startup phase. It will actually check the boot partition to say, hey, where is Windows stored at? Normally it's stored in C drive slash Windows folder. But what happens if you don't put it there? You put it somewhere else. You can do that. The boot partition actually is a tool that tells Windows or tells the computer where Windows is actually at. That way, it knows how to load it. Here's a graphical representation of that. Okay, now let's talk about the file systems. NTFS use a smaller allocation units. Basically, it means the chunks of a hard drive can get smaller and smaller, so it's more efficient than other versions. Uh, XFAT is normally used for external devices like USB jump drives or USB hard drives. Uh, NTFS is common to Windows. XFAT is more universal, so you can take that to a Linux or, Mac, uh, or Apple computer, and it can read it. An NTFS uh, device, a Mac or Linux, has issues with. FAT32, FAT16 are older versions of a file system that are still around but are going away. Uh, those are all for hard drives, though. Uh, if we have a CD or DVD, guess what? We have file systems for those, too. Again, the file system is basically just a indexer for how the data is stored on the device. So, a CD, the data is stored there, but the file system says how the data will actually be stored, how it will be structured, how it will be organized. That's all controlled by the file system. For our CDs and DVDs, we use the CDFS for CDs, and we use the UDF, or the Universal Disk Format, for DVDs or Blu-rays or anything higher. We also have a command prompt. What's really interesting here is we've been doing the tools via the GUI, but that's not necessarily the case. We can do almost all tools from the command line. While the command line 
might be more challenging for some, for others it's a lot easier. So we're going to cover some of those tools. So notice here, we're at the C colon slash users Gene Andrew folder. Uh, the little caret after Gene Andrew just kind of lets you know what folder you're at. The flashes just denote what folders you're in. There are two levels of command prompt. Uh, that's the standard window versus the elevated window. Essentially, a regular window for users or a advanced one for administrators. Normal tasks you can just do in a regular window, but sometimes you might have to focus on doing area might uh, having to do a task that require administrator access. A standard uh, command line won't work. You actually have to do it from the administrator command line. And really the only difference is the command line has access to the administrator credentials. So it'll actually the word administrator will appear in the command line at the top left hand corner. That's just to let you know that you're logged in as a administrator. Tips for working within the command line is normally uh, have a clear screen. You normally can do that by typing CLS. That clears it. You can use the up and down arrows to retrieve the commands. If you uh, are doing a command and it, for whatever reason it's freaking out or it's acting unexpectedly, control break or control pause will terminate the command and then exit to actually exit the command line. Now, these are just some tips. These are none of the actual command that will actually be running. Uh, now we have to talk about the naming convention. Within the command line, spaces are important. And so sometimes while navigating, spacing is important. Um, normally we are allowed to use letters A through Z and numbers 0 through 9 and sp very specific characters. If uh, we're trying to access a file name with spaces, because the space is not one of those characters we can use, we have to clo uh, close them in quotation marks. That way we can actually tell the, the command line, hey, there's a space in here, but that's okay. That's why we use the double quotation marks. Next, we have wildcards. Normally, the uh, asterisk or the question mark. Uh, the question mark normally is just for one character. The asterisk is for many. And that just allows us to access certain things. The example given is directory or dir a star dot question mark question mark question mark what that basically is going to run is it wants to list the directory of or view the directory of a file that is a and anything else dot is a file that has three letters for an extension normally all extensions are three letters but not always sometimes there are four HTML, for example, is for instead of HTML. Uh, you have to have a fourth question mark for that, or use a star. But we do have different types of wildcards. Uh, normally, we use them to, to help manipulate whatever command we're trying to run. So some of the commands we use are help. Uh, Normally, help and the command or the question mark will give us help. Uh, one of the first commands is xcopy or copy. You can do that using the subsequent commands that are listed help xcopy or xcopy slash question mark. Both work to get help for those commands. Uh, DIR 
it'll normally list the, the directory, but there's different ways to do that. And here are some of the switches or the conditions for running that command. Let's say, for example, we want to do a directory, but we want to see all files that are text files only. We can do a dir star dot text that lists all files with the text file extension in the directory that we're looking at. If we want to look in a different directory with the dir, it'd be dir the directory path slash and the condition. Most people will not use this all that much, but these are important tools because when you start scheduling tasks, you can use these commands to make your life easier, faster, and less complicated. It takes some time to get used to, but they're well worth using. Uh, within this uh, server realm, you actually have a lot more commands that you're able to run and help actually the administrators save a lot of time. Some of the commands to manage files and folders are the md or a make directory, the cd or change directory, or the rd remove directory commands. You also have the ability to delete, rename, or copy Anything that you can do through the GUI, you can do this through the command line. It's just, do you know how? Recovery or XCopy also. XCopy is cut, essentially. Recover is, will allow you to try to uh, recover a file if it's uh, corrupted. The recovery command I've had issues with uh, sometimes works. Sometimes it doesn't, but if you know these commands, you have that ability to at least try them. Robocopy as well. A robocopy is just another form of command copy. We also can do our check disk from the command line. Uh, we were looking at the uh, check disk for GUI, but we have the ability to do it through the command line as well. Defrag, same thing. We can do that through the command line. We can also manage our drives from the command line. Format, I want to be careful with because you could format the wrong drive. So you want to be careful with the format command. But it's there if you need to use it. Same thing with shutdown. You can shut down uh, or restart. Uh, delay if you need to. Here's a great uh, command that is often overlooked. Normally in a lab setting you don't want to have to turn off the computers individually so you can actually use the shutdown command to shut down the computer. So now that we've covered some of the commands don't worry if you don't know all of them by heart right now. That's why we have labs. The commands are something that we have to spend time doing for us to really get them. Next is our disk management to manage our hard drives. This is actually going to be the last topic for chapter 3, but it's one of those important topics. Disk management is the Windows built-in tool, the GUI tool, not the command line tool, but the GUI tool for managing our hard drive. That includes partitions, or prepping uh, new hard drives for use, uh, managing the partitions, managing the file systems, everything. Disk management, if you right click on computer, go on manage, you have disk management in that window. Here is what disk management looks like. Notice we have a basic disk disk zero, it's called basic, so we're using partitions. If it was a dynamic disk, it would actually be listed as dynamic, and the color would be changing a little bit, and it would be known as a volume. 
Partition and volume are typically used interchangeably, but they really are not the same thing. If, it, the, if the disk type is basic, you're partitioned. If it, the disk type is dynamic, you're working with volumes. Here, Gene Andrew is trying to shrink a volume or shrink the partition uh, because it's using 100% of that physical disk. We actually want to change it so that we can manipulate it, so we can shrink it. We can also delete it or extend it if we had uh, additional partitions there. When you stick a new hard drive in, you have to initialize the disk. Normally Windows does this automatically for us, but not always. So, once you stick the hard disk in there, if you navigate to disk management, the first thing that pops up is initializing the disk. Basically, you're turning it on so that Windows can use it. Once you initialize it, you'll select what type of index system do you want, MBR or the newer GPT. The GPT just does larger hard drives and allows more partitions. After you select the, the actual system that you're going to be using for it, you're going to create a volume or partition and format it with a file system. You can actually mount drives, which is basically just a folder that maps to a hard drive. We have a lab discussing this more, but this is a topic that normally is never used. And it's not overly that popular. That's why you have a separate hard drive. In Windows 7, you actually have other ways to mount files that are a lot easier, which we'll cover in later chapters. Uh, Windows Dynamic Disk is essentially a software RAID. Uh, RAID from the hardware class is basically the ability to take one or more hard drives and have those hard drives do specific tasks. For example, if you want two hard drives working in one, it could be either RAID 0 or RAID 1. RAID 0 being striping, RAID 1 being mirroring. Striping means half the data on one drive, half the data on the other drive. And essentially that allows quicker speed. But if one drive dies, you lose everything. Where RAID 1, RAID 1 is an exact copy of everything on both hard drives. That way if one drive dies, you have an exact copy of everything on the other hard drive. How do we actually set these dynamic disks up? If you go to disk management and you click on a basic disk, you can actually convert to a dynamic disk. Once you do that, you cannot go back. Other things that disk management focuses on, is it healthy? Is it uh, in a failed condition. For example, if you have a RAID 1 setup and one drive dies, it will be listed as failed. Is it online? Is it on essentially? Is it active? Is it unallocated? Just you have a hard drive there that's not in use. Is the hard drive being formatted? Is it basic or dynamic? Uh, is it foreign? Or is it healthy but at risk? With dynamic, you get additional features, but those features are tied to your computer. If you take that disk out and stick it in a different computer, it's a foreign hard drive. And Windows is very finicky with foreign hard drives. Last thing we're going to talk about is configuring regional and language settings. In Windows 7 Ultimate and Enterprise, you actually can download additional language packs. We've talked about how to prepare for maintenance. We've talked about ways and tools and utilities for maintenance. We talked about tools for 
backup recovery, disaster recovery, how to use some of the command lines, and how to download some of the language packs. Thank you.